Okay. Um, so can everyone see that? Cool. Thumbs up. Okay, you can start recording now. Oh. <laughs> All right, uh, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Jonathan O'Donnell. I am currently a visiting scholar at Queen's University Belfast. <clears throat> I generally research uh, the intersection between um, religious demonologies uh, and sort of systems of social oppression and discrimination in the contemporary world. I focus specifically on post 9-11 America is kind of my field of specialty, generally speaking. And today, I'm going to be talking uh, a bit about part of my current research project, which looks broadly into the intersections between uh, contemporary demonology and ideas of technology and ecology and sort of processes around that. So this is kind of part of a, a broader, a broader project that's based more specifically on like a research paper that I wrote last year, which hasn't quite been published yet. So. I can't link to that right now, sadly. So <clears throat> the lecture is titled, And the World Was Changed, The Nephilim and the Crises of Civilization. Um, so I'll talk a bit about who the Nephilim are for those who might be unfamiliar with them um, in a little bit. Uh, but generally what I'm gonna be talking about today is um, uses of specific form of contemporary demonology that focuses on these figures called the Nephilim and their relationship to various sort of discourses of civilizational crisis. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about the types of crisis that are being leveraged in, in these discourses later. Um, the, the main title will become apparent, I think, fairly shortly. So to begin with, I want to talk a bit about the Nephilim story and where it originates. Um, so that's going to be kind of part one of this lecture and then part two I'm going to be focusing more specifically on the Nephilim in their contemporary context as opposed to in the, the their original context I guess. And to kind of look at that we need to look at what I'm broadly referring here as the Watcher myth. Um, so what are the Watchers and who are the Nephilim? So uh, the word Nephilim is generally, it comes from the Hebrew, it's generally translated as either giants or potentially as fallen ones. Um, it appears a few places in the Hebrew Bible. Um, the most notable and the most relevant that we're going to be talking about today uh, for the general history of, of the Nephilim as figures is from Genesis 4, 1 through 6, um, which reads as follows. Uh, this is the New International Version translation, I believe. Uh, when human beings began to increase in number on the earth and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of humans were beautiful and they married any of them they chose. The Nephilim were on earth in those days and also afterward, when the sons of God went to the daughters of humans and had children by them. They were the heroes of old, men of renown. So in the narrative of Genesis, this takes place shortly before the flood. Um, and the flood narrative is a very crucial aspect to what later becomes kind of Nephilim mythology, generally speaking. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that shortly. They also appear in a couple, uh, and they appear distinctly in one other place and then debatably in a third uh, in the Hebrew Bible. Um, so the second one is in Numbers uh, 1333, uh, which is when the Israelites are scouting the land of Canaan, the promised land, like in kind of, as a kind of prelude to their like moving into that territory. And the Israelite spies who kind of go to kind of survey the land say that we saw the Nephilim there, the descendants of Anak come from the Nephilim, the Anak or the Anakim are one of the Canaanite groups that, that live in the promised land at the time. 
we seemed like grasshoppers in their own, in our own eyes and we looked the same to them. Um, so you see here this idea that the Nephilim were kind of giants or of kind of gigantic stature. They were kind of distinct from, I guess, normal humans in this context. Um, the third potential reference, and this one is this one is debated, um, is from Ezekiel 32, 27. Uh, which reads, but they do not lie down with the fallen warriors of old who went down to the realm of the dead with their weapons of war, their swords placed under their heads and their shields resting on their bones, though these warriors also had terrorized the land of the living. Um, the word for fallen here is the same root as the word is the etymology of Nephilim that is translated as fallen ones. And scholars of like scholars of the Hebrew Bible and scholars of kind of Near Eastern. Uh, ancient Near Eastern kind of cosmologies generally, like frequently debate like whether this is a reference to the Nephilim or not. Um, they kind of come down either side of the divide. So what do we have here uh, when we kind of look at it in these kind of three references? We have, we have the idea of the Nephilim who are kind of giants. Um, they are closely connected to the heroes of old, like these kind of heroic, ancient warrior figures, um, but they also are in some way the offspring of hum like the daughters of humans. Um, sometimes in, in older translations, this is translated as the daughters of men. Um, and like the sons of God. And like, who are the sons of God? Like the sons of God are kind of fairly crucial here. Yeah. Um, wait, I'll go back slightly for that, actually. Um, so the debate about who the sons of God are has been like a, an element of a lot of kind of Christian, particularly Christian theology, which is kind of my specialty, like through most of the last 2000 years. Uh, majority of churches today either deliberately don't take an official stance on the identity of the sons of God, or they have a kind of de they have a kind of reading of them as a particular line of righteous humans. Um, often this is connected to the line of Seth, um, who is Adam and Eve's kind of third son. Um, and the daughters of humans in this context are then read as the descendants of Cain, who are seen as kind of corrupt or some of some description because of that descent from, from Cain. However, this narrative in general echoes a lot of other near ancient Near Eastern cosmologies in which essentially like divine beings or gods intermarry or intermix with humans and create kind of hybrid offspring who are often giants, often like dissimilar from ordinary humans. Um, often the heroes we think of like if you look if you think of kind of ancient mythologies around heroes they're often demigods for example um, and that's like that's very much the so there's that narrative in which the sons of god were in some sense divine beings uh, they're traditionally interpreted in this line of questioning as angels specifically and Generally speaking, this idea of angels intermixing with humans and creating these hybrid offspring uh, is a very key element of a lot of ancient Near Eastern runnings with this narrative, uh, but also in the kind of contemporary demonology that I'll be talking about. So one of the key points about the Nephilim, um, which is specifically related to demonology, is the Nephilim are often tied directly to the origin of demons um, within a lot of ancient Near Eastern texts. Um, so the idea, I mentioned that this was before the flood. So one of the key elements of this narrative is that the Nephilim exist primarily in the antediluvian era. They exist prim uh, prior to the flood and the flood is what kills them essentially, is what drives them to, I guess, extinction. But there's this narrative that comes out of this, um, which 
draws directly on their kind of hybridity, on their, their nature as not fully human or not fully divine. Um, and this becomes very key to our narratives of the origin of demons that exist in the age, in kind of late in antiquity, in the kind of what is referred to generally as the second temple period of, of ancient Judaism, um, where there's this idea that the Nephilim, because of their hybridity, could not pass on or go anywhere after they died. So they kind of hang around, their spirits kind of hang around on earth haunting specific places. And this is often read as the origin of where demons come from in this context. There's this idea that, and the reason that demons possess people um, is specifically tied to this. It's tied to this idea that the spirits of the Nephilim crave physical bodies again, uh, that they, they want to be able to physically embody uh, the way they used to. So, this relates to the watches. So I mentioned that the sons of God uh, were a kind of debated concept within this narrative, but they're generally read as angels or divine beings of some description. Uh, these individuals become known as the watchers over time. So the story of the sons of God, which has like essentially like that one major reference in the book of Genesis and Genesis 4, one through six, gets greatly expanded in apocryphal and pseudepigraphic texts, um, which exist in the pseudepigraphic is essentially texts that are written as if they were written by, the term literally means like false writing or false name. Uh, they are texts that are written as if they were written by often prominent figures within a tradition. Uh, so a good example of this would be First Enoch, which is probably one of the most central texts for the Watcher myth and for the expansion of the story of the Nephilim. Uh, the book is written as if it was written by the biblical patriarch Enoch, um, who is depicted here on the, on the right. Um, so for those of you who may or may not be familiar with the story of Enoch, uh, Enoch is a very interesting figure in the Bible because unlike other kind of biblical patriarchs who are given lengths of their lifespan and then they die, like Enoch is specifically referred to as going to walk with God rather than dying. And this is an interesting twist because this feeds into a general narrative that sort of comes about around the figure of Enoch the Enoch was, instead of dying, he was bodily taken up to heaven. Uh, and from his position in heaven, he's kind of given divine wisdom and divine knowledge that is, is not accessible to kind of people on the ground. And one of the key things that he had, and in the book of Enoch, it's kind of written as if it was Enoch writing down like this kind of wisdom that he's been given in heaven. Uh, and one of the pieces that he's given in this narrative is the story of the Watchers, is the story of the Nephilim. Um, so within this narrative, the sons of God are given specific titles. They're given the angelic title Watcher, uh, which is a specific, they're not the only Watchers, um, but they're essentially their role is to watch over the earth, like as the name would suggest. They're also interestingly given individual names. Uh, and they're given a leader. Uh, this leader is variously named depending on the text as Samyaza or Azazel, or in later texts, he's referred to as Satanael. Um, this is one of those early narratives that then feeds into the, the kind of Satan narrative that you get in the, in the New Testament. Um, this idea of this kind of leader of these angels in heaven who abandoned their position and kind of transgressed against some kind of divine law. Uh, yeah, so this is kind of, this primarily exists within the span of second temporal literature, which is kind of the literature that exists from kind of 516 BCE to 70 CE. Uh, this is the period where a lot of like early apocalyptic texts kind of get written um, in this period. Um, this 
narrative of the Watchers is general, and the narrative of the Watchers um, who abandon their duty in heaven, they some the reasons for doing this vary. Like sometimes it is often just down to lust. Essentially, they're sitting up in heaven, looking down at earth, doing their angelic duty. And then they see humans and they're like, oh, these humans are really hot. We should, we should, we should leave heaven and like go down there. Um, and interestingly, one of these narratives, they kind of make a pact because they know that this is not really a legitimate thing to be doing. So they all kind of get together and they make a pact with each other. They're all going to kind of go down as a unit and that they will kind of collectively take the punishment for this action. Um, <clears throat> But generally speaking, this narrative is generally traced to the Bab period of the Babylonian captivity when the Jews were in a captive in Babylon. And this is because of a couple of things. Um, the first, I mean, I'll ta actually tackle these in reverse order for my bullet point here. Um, the first is that they were kind of an explanation, a Jewish explanation for the existence of heroic demigods found in neighboring cultures that they encountered. So the Jews are encountering, I guess the Israelite, no, yeah, um, I'm not sure what to call them at this period of time. Maybe the Hebrews, anyway. Um, but um, the Jewish people are encountering um, narratives in other cultures of these kind of demigod heroic figures. And they're like, okay, these people, these individuals like clearly kind of exist within the general kind of cultural milieu that they're existing. Like how do we, account for their existence within our existing cosmology. Um, and so the narrative of the watchers and the narrative of these kind of angelic human hybrids um, kind of comes about as a kind of explanation for um, where these kind of demigods come from. There's a more interesting and more specific um, relationship though in a kind of Jewish rebuttal to Babylonian cultural norms. Uh, this is particularly, this was traced particularly by an Estonian scholar called like Amar Anus um, in a 2010 essay, uh, which is really, really interesting because uh, one of the things that Anus like traces is, and I'm kind of going to talk about that in a second, I think the next bullet point. Uh, no, wait, that's slightly earlier. Uh, one of the things that Annas traces is the idea is that the watch, and I'll talk about this a bit on the next slide, but the watchers don't just create like hybrid children with humans. They also teach humans a number of skills and abilities that within the narrative humans are not supposed to have. And I'll talk a bit about these on the next slide, but these skills vary. They are generally often related to magic. Um, so the watchers, for example, teach humans the art of divination, the arts of astrology, the arts of kind of herbalism and herbal healing. Uh, they also teach like how to make weapons and ornaments and even cosmetics. I'll talk a bit about that on the next slide. Um, but essentially the watchers are giving skills and techniques to humans that within the narrative humans are not meant to possess. And one of the things that Amar Anas like traces in his article is that the specific skills that the watchers are supposed to teach humans um, map very directly onto Babylonian narratives of antediluvian or pre-flood kind of culture sages. Um, essentially, the, in, in the kind of Babylonian narratives, you had these figures who were essentially kind of semi-divine heroes, kind of half, half deity heroes who existed both before and after the flood, because the flood narrative also exists in, in Babylonian culture. Um, but these figures taught humans a number of kind of skills and technologies, including kind of herbalism and astrology and divination, that were very, very central to kind of Babylonian cultural life. Um, these were seen as skills that marked Babylon as special and as kind of the, the pinnacle of civilization, essentially, like within Babylonian cosmology. Um, and so um, Annas thinks it's quite telling that in the kind of, in the Jewish narratives probably formulated within or shortly after the Babylonian captivity, um, the watchers are seen as teaching humanity like the exact same set of skills 
but these skills are essentially coded as wrong or as like illegitimate in some way. So essentially this was the Jews in captivity in Babylon being like, oh, you say that you were taught these skills by your gods and they make you so great, but actually these skills are really bad and that's kind of why the entire earth like was destroyed in the flood. Um, so yeah, it's kind of this, it's this rebuttal or counter to these kind of Babylonian notions of kind of cultural and cultural supremacy, essentially. Yeah, um, so, but generally speaking, um, these general narratives of kind of angelic transgression, of hybridity, and of kind of cultural transformation and catastrophe like through the flood, um, serve as a basis for a number of different narratives. So in, in the kind of, in the original context, they serve as a kind of etiology of worldly evil. Like where does evil come from? Where, why is the world in a kind of corrupted state? Um, and this relates to both what are referred to as the kind of the Enochic and the Adamic models of fallenness. Um, so the Adamic model might be the one you're kind of most familiar with, which is essentially tied to the narrative of the Garden of Eden. Uh, that Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, and that is why the earth is in a state of fallenness. And like that's where kind of the corruption and the, the evil in the world comes from. Um, the Enochic narrative was it tied to the kind of Enochian literature, like First Enoch, was both a kind of complement and a counter to this narrative that instead rooted the source of kind of worldly corruption, like in these figures of the watchers, like in these narratives of specific kind of angelic transgression of, of these heavenly beings abandoning their station and kind of causing the disruption of the kind of normative order of the earth. Um, critically, however, also today, uh, these narratives turn up again in uh, ufological and new age discourses around things like ancient aliens and like hidden wisdom because they're also drawing partly on this narrative of um, hybridity, um, but also on narrative of the idea of aliens or spiritual beings as the source of kind of forbidden knowledge that kind of transform, radically transforms kind of culture. But we'll talk a bit about these narratives in a bit. Um, if anyone here has ever had the misfortune to watch episodes of Ancient Aliens, as I myself unfortunately have, um, the story of the Nephilim and the Watchers like actually turns up like quite frequently. Um, it's very prominent within like Eric von Daniken's like famous Chariots of the Gods kind of book, um, because uh, essentially he's he's looking at these narratives and he's like he reads the Sons of God as aliens essentially rather than angels or essentially within this narrative, and so the Nephilim become like alien human hybrids, like within this context, rather than like angel human hybrids. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so this is kind of interesting because the use of the Nephilim within, this is kind of, I guess, where my research kind of came from, where the impetus of my research came from. Um, because while there is like, there's a significant amount of scholarship on the narrative of the Nephilim and the narrative of the Watchers in its kind of original historical context, like during the Second Temple period, like where it comes from, what it responds to, what it's kind of meaning. Uh, but there's also a bit of scholarship on its usage in contemporary like UFO culture and contemporary ancient, ancient alien discourses and alt history, but also in like New Age uh, narratives broadly. However, there was very little scholarship that I noticed on its usage in contemporary Christianity itself, and particularly in contemporary evangelicalism in America, which is kind of my area of specialty. Um, and this is partly due, I think, to what I'm calling the Sethite reading of the sons of God, the idea that the sons of God were not angels, but were in fact merely righteous humans kind of descended from Adam and Eve's third son, Seth. Uh, and this is the narrative that is generally prominent within a lot of kind of mainline churches and kind of more, I guess, non-evangelical, or even, even evangelical forms of Christianity. Um, but I noticed 
uh, in my research that the kind of re-supernaturalized framing, this framing of them not merely as righteous humans, but as angels who inter interbred with, with humanity, um, has started to kind of gain ground and return, particularly within kind of forms of Pentecostal and charismatic evangelicalism. Uh, and I think this is for a number of reasons. I think the most obvious one is that demonology is a very, very crucial part of Pentecostal and charismatic evangelicalism today. And as part of that, they need an explanation for kind of where demons come from and what demons are. And the Nephilim narrative is in a lot of ways like one of the original narratives like in early Christianity and in kind of late antiqu in the antiquity for where demons come from. Like that relies on this idea of them as, as kind of hybrid entities that crave physical bodies but can't fully possess them, um, which are kind of haunting the world. So I think there's an element in which it was kind of just a readily apparent um, option. But I noticed that this was gaining ground. And so I started to kind of do some research into it. And I'm gonna be talking a bit about that a lot more kind of in the second part of this lecture. Um, but like, why are these people drawing on, on this narrative of the Nephilim? Like, why are they, and this kind of ties into the odd places that the story seems to get referenced, not just in the Hebrew Bible, but also in the New Testament as well, although obliquely. So, yeah, wait, I'll just, so, the Book of Enoch that kind of fleshes out the, the Watcher narrative and the narrative of the Nephilim does not, um, is not canonical. It's not part of the biblical canon. It's, essentially, it's an apocryphal text. Um, however, it was part of the general cultural milieu that early Christianity emerges from. Like it, it exists within that general context. Um, narratives of the Watchers are also prevalent, say, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which were existing kind of around that period. It's a very, like, popular common narrative. And there are a few places in the New Testament that the narrative seems to get referenced and seems to get referenced in, in ways that are significant for how the story gets taken up. So the first of which is the narrative of Six Jude. Um, which refers to, and the angels who did not keep their positions of authority, but abandoned their proper dwelling, these he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. So this narrative that there are these angels who abandoned their position, who have been kind of placed under judgment. Um, and this is a narrative that kind of comes up in the Watcher story, uh, because while the Nephilim as hybrids kind of linger on earth, the Watchers themselves were, were angels. They were purely kind of heavenly beings. Um, and so like they get punished in a way that's far more, I guess, direct. They tend to get bound or imprisoned. Uh, and this, the, the specific relationship to the Watchers or to the sons of God is reinforced more specifically in 2 Peter 2, 4 through 10. Um, for if God did not, this is basically with like narratives of um, judgment about uh, for sin, essentially. Uh, for if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them in chains of darkness to be held for judgment. Uh, if he did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood on its ungodly people, but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness and seven others. So like this is specifically now tying the narrative of the angels who sinned and are kept into chains to the narrative of Noah and to the narrative of the flood. Uh, but then the narrative goes on to compare this to the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by burning them to ash and made them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. If he rescued Lot, a righteous man who was distressed by the depraved conduct of the lawless, etc. If this is so, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and hold the unrighteous for punishment on the day of judgment. This is especially true for those who follow the corrupt desire of the flesh and despise authority. So you have this narrative here that's emerging of this correction between kind of corrupted desire, uh, a 
the kind of despising or the refusal of authority um, that is here played out specifically in the relationship between on the one hand, the angels who sinned, who are kept under darkness from the pre-flood days, but also the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah and the sparing of Lot. Um, the author, Jennifer Wright Nust, um, in her, she does, has this particularly great book on constructions of desire and like deviant desire, like within biblical narratives, um, specifically like talks about this narrative and talks about how it's the desire for kind of different flesh for, as she, as she narrates, foreign gods and foreign women, the daughter of men or angels, uh, that is read to kind of leading to judgment and destruction. So there's this narrative of deviation, of, sort of particularly sexual deviation, this relationship between this idea of the kind of transgressive desires of the angels and kind of transgressive desires of the human, um, whether this in various ways. But essentially you have this foregrounding of a narrative of sexual sin, but sexual sin also as desire for the kind of the other, the other that it should not be desired, like some form of outgroup. So this is a narrative, this is, these are the sort of brief places that the Watcher narrative is kind of obliquely referenced in the New Testament. And this is kind of, this is particularly crucial because the contemporary evangelicals that I study, they're often accused of using, as they do, uh, because they do do this, um, of using kind of non-biblical, non-canonical texts to construct their, their narratives and their demonologies. Um, so they point to verses like this in order to kind of create this general framing of legitimacy and of kind of quasi canonicity for things like the Book of Enoch. They're like, yeah, the Book of Enoch isn't really canon, but it was part of the milieu that the New Testament writers were operating in. And therefore, and because they kind of referenced it, there's clearly a kind of element of divine inspiration maybe there. And they kind of use this like as their rationale for why they're drawing on, on this narrative in general. Um, but what were the Watchers crimes specifically? And I think that's kind of something that I'm really gonna to need to talk about. So in addition to ideas of kind of sexual or ontological transgression, this like intermarrying, this abandoning of your station within heaven, it's kind of mixing of like, the Watcher myth also contains ideas of cultural and technological change, uh, which I kind of referenced in the earlier ideas of kind of the Babylonian culture heroes. So the Watchers teach humans, um, and who they teach humans is debatable, like sometimes in narratives, because there's several different variants of the Watcher narrative. Um, sometimes they teach their wives first, they're like human wives who then kind of spread this knowledge. Sometimes they kind of teach it to humanity more broadly. But they teach humans the arts of herbalism, magic, astrology, the interpretation of omens, lunar cycles, warfare, and cosmetics. Um, the latter two are particularly interesting because they are specifically the ones taught by Azazel, who in these narratives is kind of positioned as the leader of the Watchers. Um, and are often framed within the narrative of having the greatest impact. So for reference, like the other watchers, although they get named, the descriptions of what they teach is usually limited to a very short sentence. It's just, this watcher taught the art of uh, the cutting of roots and the, you know, the cycle of the stars. And, and like, that's kind of it. Azazel, however, gets this more extensive narrative here. Azazel taught men to make swords and daggers and shields and breastplates. And he showed the metals and the art of making them bracelets and ornaments and the art of making up the eyes and of beautifying the eyelids and the most precious and choice stones and all kinds of colored dyes. And the world was changed and there was great impiety and much fornication and they went astray and their ways became corrupt. So Azazel's just kind of down here, just teaching everyone how to fight and look, look amazing, like constantly basically. And this is just like, this is not on. Um, within this narrative. Uh, but I think this is really interesting here because the specific narrative of why the world is changed, why the world is kind of made corrupt, 
is specifically tied to kind of narratives of conflict, but also kind of beautification. There's this idea of, of kind of sexual transgression of the kind of, yeah, there was great impiety and much fornication as the, as the narrative states. Um, so scholars have kind of talked about the, the different skills that the watchers kind of teach humanity. Um, Carol Newsom, who's kind of a, a scholar of this period of history, um, writes that like translated into more abstract terms, like the skills that the watchers teach uh, name three of the less admirable techniques by which desire accomplishes its object by techniques of force, by techniques of seduction, and by techniques of manipulation. Manipulation here, like she's kind of referring to kind of magic, to divination, to kind of ways of kind of manipulating the physical world rather than kind of interpersonal uh, manipulation. But essentially, this is kind of especially crucial to the narrative of the Watchers because as she goes on, the Watcher's threat and the threat of the Nephilim is kind of twofold in these narratives. They, on the one hand, they infected human beings with their own transgressive desires, their own kind of breaching of their like ontological categories as angels, but they also equipped them with the means to accomplish them. Uh, they don't just, they don't just kind of corrupt humanity, they teach humanity these skills for kind of to perpetuate this, this kind of process. Um, I, I, do, I do love that passage of Adazazel. I just, I just think it's great. <laughs> um, but essentially this, is, this idea is, is particularly important. This idea that they both are kind of, they are like a vectors for kind of greater transgression. They not only are themselves agents of transgression, but they kind of equip humanity more broadly with um, the skills to kind of perpetuate this, to, to change the world, to transform the world in ways that are not aligned with these ideas of divine will and which kind of beckon catastrophe and destruction. Because we have to remember uh, that this all is framed as a prelude for the flood, essentially. Um, so essentially within these narratives, there's this idea that the watchers come down, they teach humanity all these skills, everything kind of falls apart. Um, and then as a kind of last ditch attempt to kind of put everything back to normal, um, God wipes everyone out other than Noah in the flood uh, and kind of does clean slate, start over, etc. cetera. Um, so there's this idea of this kind of figure of cultural decline, which leads to this kind of catastrophe, which leads to um, this kind of need for a, a new start. This relates broadly as well to narratives of consumption and control that I kind of want. This is kind of the last part of part one that I'm going to be talking about. So, yeah. The Watch and Nephilim narrative, um, in addition to those elements of corruption, also contains elements of destructive consumption and narratives of illegitimate rule. So as this is kind of a quote from first Enoch from one of the narrative texts, he, um, the text writes, the Nephilim consumed all the acquisitions of men. And when men could no longer sustain them, the giants turned against them and devoured mankind. And they began to sin against birds and beasts and reptiles and fish and to devour one another's flesh and to drink the blood. And then the earth laid accusation against the lawless ones. So this is framed as the kind of immediate uh, prelude to the flood. This idea that the Nephilim, uh, because of their kind of unsanctioned hybridity, because of their like in their kind of their non-belonging, their kind of place like outside of the natural order. Um, are causing this kind of ecological devastation, this ecological havoc. They're turning to cannibalism. Um, they're consuming humanity. They're consuming the labor of humanity's kind of actions, uh, like crops and, and foodstuffs, but also kind of other, other animals. Um, and the earth kind of lays accusation against them. The, sometimes translations render so like the earth kind of cries out for, for justice or for judgment. Um, 
the relationship to blood here is, I think, interesting because this ties back to the narrative of Cain in Genesis with the idea that when Cain slays Abel, like Abel's kind of blood calls out from the ground for, for kind of justice and for um, vengeance. Um, so there's this idea here of kind of the spilling of blood uh, on the earth and then the earth kind of cries out for, for restoration, for, um, for justice. Uh, this also relates, yeah, so uh, the scholar Matthew Goff um, situates this narrative within ancient motifs of kind of death as devourer, um, talking specifically about how like this construction of kind of monstrous appetites is key to this idea of Nephilim threat. Their insatiability drives their actions and has disastrous consequences for the earth and for themselves. So in this narrative, like everything has kind of gone out of whack. Humanity is like, Humanity's kind of descended into this image of kind of decadence that these writers are kind of constructing, but also the Nephilim themselves are consuming everything and there's kind of this widespread ecological and environmental catastrophe that's kind of being brought about from them. Uh, there's also within this a specific narrative of rulership or control uh, that is going to be kind of important momentarily. Um, and this is because of the ties that I discussed earlier between kind of mythic heroes and ideas of kingship um, that are also tied to the Nephilim. A uh, good example of this um, is that the Book of the Giants, which is part of the Dead Sea Scrolls, specifically identifies the Sumerian mythic king Gilgamesh as one of the Nephilim. Um, for those of you who may or may not be aware of Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh is the hero of the oldest, I think, piece of literature that we know, which is the Epic of Gilgamesh. It's the ancient kind of Sumerian Babylonian um, cultural epic. Um, and this text explicitly positions Gilgamesh, who was not a biblical figure, um, as a descendant of the Nephilim, kind of very much tying this relationship of the Nephilim to kingship and to like, to rule, but particularly rule by, uh, as we'll see, by illegitimate or rulers who are not seen as kind of divinely inspired. For example, in the Bible as well, uh, when this narrative is applied, it's applied to the Anakim, to the, son, to the children of Anak, who I mentioned earlier from kind of Numbers um, 1333, but it's also applied to figures like Nimrod and other, and Goliath, and Og of Bashan and various other kind of biblical figures who are positioned as large of statue, as giants, as kind of larger than ordinary humans. And these people become positioned within these narratives as descended in some sense from the Nephilim. Um, how exactly this works, given that a lot of these people, most of these people exist after the flood and the Nephilim were supposed to be wiped out in the flood is like a position that is debated and has a lot of different explanations within the literature, like both, I guess, ancient literature, but also contemporary, the contemporary stuff that I'm gonna be talking about momentarily. Um, explanations generally, um, the most common explanations are that the, Neph the watchers came back after the flood somehow, um, that kind of ties back into that element in the Genesis Genesis narrative, um, which is the idea that like, it's like, it says something like the Nephilim were on earth in those days and also after. So there's the idea of like, the Nephilim weren't just before the flood. Um, but at least after the flood, they don't have this kind of widespread cultural influence that they did kind of before. Uh, the other explanation that's often given is that the flood was regional rather than global. Um, so although it wiped out like most of the Nephilim, like some of them survived over there somewhere in the distance. Um, but essentially um, there is this idea of uh, these kind of giant of statue rulers being connected to the Nephilim somehow. Uh, the figure of Nimrod is, is particularly interesting because although Nimrod himself does, is not actually associated with the Tower of Babel, like within the biblical narrative, in 
extra kind of biblical literature, uh, starting with kind of Josephus in the early, in kind of, uh, in the, I guess, early CE. Um, Nimrod becomes very closely tied, like, as the builder of the Tower of Babel. Um, and this, of course, then is, and this is the way that he's used in contemporary narratives. He's very much assumed to be the, the builder of Babel. Um, and this generally kind of reinforces this narrative uh, that is a prominent part of the Watcher myth, reinforcing ideas of transgression, of rebellion, of divine judgment. The idea that the tower was built um, to, to make a name, to kind of like this narrative of kind of humans achieving apotheosis or godhood through the labor of their own hands, um, which then kind of beckons divine judgment. Um, and it's here like through the figure of Nimrod, like tied explicitly in these narratives to the Nephilim, uh, to this idea of the kind of the transgression of the watches. They're kind of creating this, I guess, like holistic narrative of these forms of divine transgression being rooted in in like the Watcher incursion, like in the narrative of the Watchers, of this kind of Enochic tradition of the etiology of worldly evil as related to kind of angelic transgression. Um, so, and this is kind of the end of part one, so I'm gonna kind of pause here. Uh, so the Watcher myth, as I kind of, and the myth of the Nephilim that I've kind of outlined here, uh, combines notions of sexual, ontological, technological, and ecological threat. So it combines these different ideas of threat that are kind of differently emphasized in different parts of the texts, uh, but all kind of exist as a coherent, or I guess as a semi-cohesive kind of whole. Um, and as I'm kind of kind of talk about shortly, like I think this, this way that the narrative joins these disparate notions of threat kind of into a coherent whole is particularly central to why this narrative gets taken up um, today in ways that I'm going to be talking about momentarily. So that is the end of part one. So I'm going to stop sharing briefly. So uh, you can start recording again. Okay. Part two. The return of the Nephilim. <laughs> um, so these are these are four books of the many books that I have had the misfortune to read. Um, these are all books that construct what I'm referring to as kind of contemporary Nephilim demonologies. Uh, they they differ in a number of ways that I'll kind of talk on shortly. But this kind of gives you. I think if you look at the titles of some of these, like it gives you kind of a general overview of how Nephilim demonologies are kind of being, being taken up today. Um, so yeah, I'll probably flick back to this slide. Nephilim's return. So as I mentioned earlier, like I noticed the general return of Nephilim demonologies within contemporary evangelical literature. Um, and broadly, I identified kind of three separate camps of evangelical texts that use what I'm calling the supernatural versions of the Nephilim, the idea that they were literally kind of angelic human hybrids rather than like purely human in some description. Uh, the first and probably the most prompt, uh, most prevalent of these camps is Nephilim simply as demon origin story. They exist to explain why demons exist, um, and they're often present but generally incidental to the myth to the general text. They're mentioned offhand as a reason why demons exist. Uh, but I still think this is quite telling because if you go back, if you look at other um, evangelical texts and other kind of particularly earlier ones, um, you don't get this just like general assumption that the Nephilim were angel human hybrids, like just being kind of listed as like an accepted fact, basically. So you have this kind of general integration of, of this more supernaturalized version of the narrative into these texts, like even if it's just as an offhand comment or as a reference. There are, however, two other um, more in-depth types of narrative that I identified. 
Um, the first is of the Nephilim and the Watchers as what I'm calling the kind of disavowed heart of Christianity. Um, <clears throat> the books on the previous slide that fall very much into this camp would be like Michael Heiser's Reversing Herman and um, Ryan Peterson's like The Judgment of the Nephilim. Uh, so these are narratives that they're both primarily historical. They look at the they kind of take, they do evangelical readings of the Nephilim narrative within its kind of more historical context, um, but narrate it in a way that it becomes central to Christianity. Um, Heiser's book is a really good example of this because it essentially positions like, so one of the narrative is that kind of Jesus comes to earth in order to kind of save humanity from sin, like through his, through his sacrifice on the cross. Whereas in Heiser's narrative, like this is true, but he specifically comes to rectify the sin of the Watchers specifically. Um, it's it's the sin of the Watchers. It's the sin of the like, the creation of the Nephilim that is like the impetus for why humanity kind of descends into the sinful state that then needs to be kind of rectified through um, through Jesus. And we'll talk a bit about why this narrative kind of comes to be important later, because it often has to do with the way that the Nephilim narrative of hybridity starts to be particularly associated with ideas of bloodlines and purity and narratives of salvation. The third kind of camp of texts, which would be formed in the previous like books like Thomas Horne's Forbidden Gates, and Rob Skeever's kind of Archon invasion, like very much fall into this third camp, which is apocalyptic narratives of the Nephilim's return, like what I'm calling kind of neo-Nephilim eschatologies. Um, so whereas like in the second set of texts will primarily focus on the Nephilim as a kind of historical reality, like as something that existed in the past and was kind of crucial for the emergence of Christianity, these third camp texts will position narratives in which the Nephilim aren't just in the past, they're also going to return in the future. They're, also, they're coming back. Um, and the way that they come back varies by the text. And I'll talk about some of that in a bit. Um, yeah, the second and third camp texts explicitly are notable for integrating material, both from apocryphal and pseudepigraphic texts like First Enoch, but also from pagan mythology, from wider kind of a culture or spiritualities, from ufology and from alternative history. Uh, a good example of this is Ryan Peterson's um, Judgment of the Nephilim, like has a few references to Atlantis and Lemuria just kind of thrown into it, like as if these were kind of just accepted parts of the narrative. Like other texts, like um, the book by Linda Rios Brooke called Lucifer's War, which like also does the similar thing, kind of referencing the idea of ancient lost advanced civilizations, like very much tying on into kind of alt history narratives popularized by people like Graham Hancock, for example, um, like as part of, of this kind of general, what is essentially kind of Christian eschatology, but modified through inclusion of these other elements. Um, ufology, narratives of alien abduction play crucial aspects of these, like, although it varies how they get framed. So for example, sometimes they're framed as a kind of illegitimate cover. So like essentially that it's actually demons and Nephilim doing all of these alien abduction style things and narratives of aliens are just there to kind of cover it up and give it a kind of secular veneer, I guess. Um, or sometimes they're just aliens, like straight up, it, like, it varies. Um, but essentially what I kind of want to point out here is that these contemporary texts are very, what you might call syncretic. They're not just relying on sort of biblical narratives or Christian eschatology. They're drawing very heavily, not just on kind of contemporary culture, which is the thing that, that prophecy, apocalyptic prophecies kind of do generally, but they're drawing very explicitly like on kind of pagan myths, on general like occult spirituality, on like UFO and alien abduction narratives, on alternative history narratives, to kind of create these composite, um, I guess, eschatologies. Uh, and I think this is kind of important because I do think that one of the background reasons for why the Nephilim are coming back, like not just because 
as I'll talk about its, its kind of resonances for the moment, but also is due to things like the rise in prominence of ancient alien discourse, like of kind of these like Eric von Daniken style narratives that have kind of brought these figures more into popular consciousness in a way. Um, Critically, these kind of three camps of texts exist in conversation. They're not simply a linear trajectory. Uh, and I'll talk about some of the examples of that like momentarily. Um, I think there's a couple that are very, very telling. Um, but all of these kind of texts exist within a kind of the same broader milieu. So while you have, might have some texts who kind of go all in on occult spirituality and using sort of pagan mythologies and using alien abduction narratives. Uh, there'll be others that would be more kind of just kind of standard Pentecostal or charismatic texts, but they'll kind of use ideas like from those more like extensive narratives. Like there'll be phrases and hints and tropes that they'll draw on that will be like, oh, you're probably getting that from, from these other texts. Um, yeah. Modern Nephilim demonologies generally contain pro what I'm calling processes of racialization. I'll talk a bit about racialization later, but also anxieties of technological and cultural shift that map broadly onto reactionary political agendas more broadly. And it's worth noting that a lot of these figures are related to, um, yeah, um, are generally conservative evangelicals, conservative Christians broadly, who are using this narrative within a general framework of narratives of kind of cultural decline of the kind of decline of specifically America away from a kind of Christian identity, kind of construction of Christian identity. Um, one of the interesting examples of where this came up actually last year is in one of the figures that I have here um, at the bottom. Uh, this is uh, Pastor Stella Emanuel, who you may remember. Um, if any of you remember last year, kind of in the summer, there was a weird headline that went around about demon sperm. Um, do any of you remember the demon sperm controversy? And so Stella Emanuel here is, is the preacher who came out with demon sperm. Um, <clears throat> Essentially, like how this this set up is that Donald Trump retweeted uh, a tweet by Stella that was critique. I think it's essentially like a COVID denial tweet. It was like kind of dealing with um, it was a kind of COVID related conspiracy. Um, <clears throat> and like commentators kind of jumped on this by pointing out the places where she'd also discussed things like ideas of demon sperm, but also ideas of alien DNA, like contaminating humanity. Um, and there was generally this kind of tying into this general kind of anti-vaccine, like suspicion of the medical establishment narrative that related to kind of this changing of humanity through the introduction of alien DNA um, in kind of things like vaccines. Um, but she also, as part of this whole kind of narrative of aliens and of demons, specifically uses the Nephilim. Like she specifically uses contemporary ideas of the Nephilim, like as behind both alien narrative, themes of alien DNA introduction and also kind of demonic and spiritual warfare. Um, and that kind of gives a general example of, of one of the ways um, that these narratives are used that I think kind of leads into the broader framework that these things are drawing on. Yeah, particularly narratives I've got here of conspiracy and control. This is a, another book by Thomas Horn um, of Forbidden Gates fame. Um, I should note that like, I would say that Thomas Horn is one of the foremost figures like pushing contemporary Nephilim demonologies like in, in kind of the US uh, evangelical context. He's not especially major, like he's arguably a fringe figure, but he's a fringe figure who has a number of connections to, I guess, more mainstream or mainline kind of evangelical organizations. Um, he runs a small publishing house based in Missouri called Defender, which publishes a lot of the more explicitly conspiratorial evangelical texts, essentially. 
um, as the, I mean, you can't, this is a slightly blurry image, I'm afraid. Um, but essentially, this is a book about the New World Order and the idea of the shadow government behind the US government, like controlling everything. Um, I'm not sure if Horn specifically like uses the Nephilim like in this specific book, but they're like a major feature of his kind of broader like oeuvre, I guess. Um, so they kind of lurk in the background. Yeah, so I noticed, uh, I noted earlier the ideas of illegitimate rule or rebellious rule were very, very central to a lot of the way that Nephilim demonologies kind of got constructed historically, this idea of the kind of corrupt ruler. And this trope gets very heavily taken up in contemporary evangelical use of, of Nephilim demonology, where it kind of intersects, yeah, with broader conservative conspiracist cultures and libertarian political agendas, particularly right-wing libertarian in the kind of American sense here. Um, this kind of varies depending on the text. Uh, a good example, so like, Rob Skiba, who of Archon Invasion fame, um, has this rather glorious passage towards the end of the book where he has a list of rhetorical questions about the true goals of various conspiracy beliefs, including ideas of kind of elite bloodlines, of chemtrails, of genetically modified food, contaminated water, population control, international sustainability projects, and then answers each one of these with the word Nephilim. So he essentially constructs this narrative where he's like, what is the purpose of chemtrails? Nephilim. What is the purpose of UN environmental sustainability projects? Nephilim. Why are all the presidents in the US related through like occult bloodlines? Nephilim. And it just like goes on like this for like almost a page. But it's like, it's kind of this really good example of the way that the Nephilim kind of become integrated into all of these disparate conspiracies that this, this person is kind of weaving. There are some or other kind of more interesting, or yeah, so other authors have created kind of complex trans historical narratives um, that position like a hidden Luciferian hand, like tied to the Nephilim as guiding global history from ancient Babylon to the modern United Nations. It ties very much strongly into kind of broader, um, broader kind of evangelical conspiracies of kind of the new world order of the rise of the kind of empire of antichrist and things like that uh, but it's kind of given a specific kind of nephilim oriented twist so there's generally in these narratives there's this idea that this is leading towards a kind of nephilim resurrection scenario where like they kind of return and take over the world essentially um <clears throat> It's worth noting that one of the figures who I'm referencing here, like L.A. Marzulli, who I might talk about later, like has appeared on Ancient Aliens like several times, <laughs> like as a guest. So he, he, he is very explicitly kind of also operating within those kind of ufological circles. He has a number of, I hesitate to call them documentaries, but do documentary style things where he's basically running around the world like chasing Nephilim. So he's like always focused on like, a legends of giants discovered in the Middle East or like strange like hybrid fairy entities or whatever that he's discovered. Um, he, it, yeah, he, it, it's almost like, I don't think it's worth watching, but if you like, if you kind of like, if you get some weird pleasure out of things like the ancient alien discourse, like some of his things just might be worth checking out, like just, just for that. Um, uh, other, other, um, authors have more nebulous things. So for example, the author Derek Gilbert, who's a, an associate of Horn in his 2016 book, um, The Great Inception, I believe it's called, um, links the watchers directly to the founding of the city-states in Mesopotamia and uh, tying into things like the Gilgamesh story and like Gilgamesh's Nephilim, and then parallels the mass production of ration bowls for urban laborers in Uruk to the modern welfare state. And like, so he's describing this and he's just like, then he just has this aside where he's just like, even then people exchange their freedom for government rations. Um, I'm not entirely sure whether like it's entirely fair to like compare like an ancient city state based probably on highly exploited effectively slave labor to like 
the welfare state. Um, but this is kind of a really good example of like the political orientation that these people are coming from. They're like, Nephilim are tied to ideas of illegitimate rule. Uh, what do you associate illegitimate rule with? They associate it with cities on the one part, like tying into this general narrative of conservative evangelical like anti-urbanism, this position of the urban as kind of the side of, of decadence and corruption, but also specifically like ideas of the kind of the liberal welfare state, this idea of like the liberal state is somehow corrupt or, or decadent, um, which is very prominent within evangelical narratives. Um, the way that Gilbert does this connection is really interesting in that he kind of does it etymologically um, which is basically the, the Aramaic word for watcher is, I mean, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to butcher this because I don't speak Aramaic or Hebrew, uh, but the word for watcher is ir, spell, usually spelled like apostrophe I, uh, I, Y, R. Uh, but also the Hebrew word for city is also spelled generally transliterated the same. So he, he uses this kind of etymological connection, like there's not really an etymological connection, it's more like a, a homophony or like a, and a similarity of appearance to be like, oh, watcher, city, looks like the same word, clearly a connection, watch is also related to Gilgamesh, therefore watchers found the first cities connected to urbanism, connected to kind of the, the rise of, and he very much like juxtaposes this to what he positions as kind of the natural state of humanity, which is coded in this kind of quasi-libertarian kind of survivalist terms of like living out in the wilderness, kind of off the land, um, which like this kind of, he very much frames it as kind of agrarian existence, but it's obviously an agrarian existence kind of very much influenced by contemporary conservative American ideas of kind of um, of, of like living out in, in the countryside, in the rural as kind of this um, natural state as opposed to kind of the city as this, as this site of kind of decadence and corruption. Um, anxieties around technology, uh, however, are also often central to these particular currents. Um, and this is kind of where it starts to get even wilder in contemporary Yafalim demonologies. So, yeah, technology as is often, has often been very central to contemporary apocalypticisms, like broadly speaking. Uh, good examples of this would be um, when they first invented like planes, there were readings of apocalyptic prophecies at the time that read planes into the Bible, um, specifically as like reigning destruction. Um, other narratives, for example, like there's that narrative of where when Jesus returns, like in the in the narrative of Revelation, like the entire world kind of sees him return. And it was like so that and a lot of like even a lot of kind of apocalyptic preachers kind of early on were like, how is this gonna happen? Is it gonna be like a collective vision that everyone sees? And then they invented television. And then then they, they were like, oh. This is how everybody sees Jesus return because it's broadcast live on the news and everybody sees it. So there's this kind of integration of technology and sort of emerging technologies into apocalyptic narratives. Um, in Nephilim demonologies, these take the form generally of emerging technologies, specifically ideas of genetic engineering, ideas of nanotech, uh, ideas of AI, these kind of emerging technologies that become integrated into these narratives. Um, this uh, happens twofold. And this is based on a very loose reading of the line in Matthew 24, 37, that as the days of Noah were, so shall the coming of the son of man be. So essentially that Jesus's return is going to be in some sense a repetition of the days of Noah, or which as we kind of discussed earlier, have been very much tied to this narrative of the Nephilim. Um, it's worth noting that the Matthew then goes on to talk about like almost in a more kind of symbolic sense like it talks about how like everybody kind of eating and drinking and partying like unaware of the kind of catastrophe that's about to befall them so like in the verse you can very much read it as this more symbolic sense of like nobody will be aware of when Jesus is going to come back it's going to be the sudden event this kind of cataclysmic event 
um, that these that most people are going to be kind of unaware of, and they're just going to be kind of laughing and partying and drinking and kind of acting as if nothing is wrong. Um, here, this very much gets literalized. Um, it is exactly going to be exactly like in the days of Noah. Uh, and what this means is, one, the apocalypse gets read as a literal return of the Nephilim or the kind of antediluvian world more broadly, but also that this vision of the apocalypse as a return of the Nephilim and as a return of the Nephilim that becomes mediated through emerging technologies, then becomes retroactively read onto the original biblical narrative. And this is where some of the overlap with like ancient alien discourse and things like that starts to come in because you, you see this kind of projection of contemporary advanced technologies kind of back into the, into the kind of historical kind of mythic narrative. Um, yeah, so emerging technologies become framed not simply as diabolically inspired, but as re-emerging. Um, a good example of this is Horn's uh, retelling of the Watcher myth in his 2009 book, where he claims that the Watchers used biotechnology to produce exotic bodies of flesh, rewriting the DNA of humans, plants, and animals. Um, so if you think back earlier in part one, I had that verse from the kind of the more, when in my assessment, the kind of ecological aspects of the Nephilim demonology, this idea that they, they sinned against like birds and fish and reptiles and kind of all these animals. Here, this gets very much explicitly read, like not just as they ate them all, but that they like somehow corrupted their DNA through demonic retroviruses. Uh, demonic retrovirus like, is, is literally a term that comes up in this book, as far as I remember. Uh, but there's essentially this projection of contemporary technologies, of contemporary like understandings of kind of genetic engineering and nanotechnology like back onto, onto the biblical record and onto the kind of biblical narrative. Um, oh, wait. Ah, I paused my screen share. Two seconds. It's better. Okay, back now. Um, yeah, and this is kind of really crucial because this idea of genetic tampering of the the way the watchers as a kind of tampering of human genetics and the genetics of other animals on Earth becomes framed in a couple of different interconnected ways. The first and the very most prevalent is this idea that it's an effort to destroy the bloodline of Jesus and or create vessels that the watchers could possess. Because uh, this, is, this is one of the other narratives that comes up here is this idea that, um, because for a lot of these people, even though they really like this narrative, the idea of angels literally having children with humans like is still a bit much as so they're like, oh, okay, what, like, what are the Nephilim? And they create this narrative in which the watchers kind of use genetic engineering to create these like soulless bodies that are like part human and part animal and part plant or something. Um, and then like, because these vessels are kind of outside of the divine order, they don't have souls and therefore the watchers can just kind of possess them. Essentially, they're kind of like, I guess like automata that can be kind of, yeah, entered into. Um, it's also read as a kind of prelude to the mark of the beast from um, in Revelation 13, 16 through 18, um, which becomes positioned here as a genetic rewriting that renders humans literally part beast, uh, and then means that the individual could no longer be saved or go to heaven because they're no longer human. Um, and it's worth pointing out here, of course, that these people are Often these texts include long rants against Darwinian evolution um, and Darwinian theories of evolution um, because it disrupts their ideas of humans as kind of unique and as special and as like quintessentially like distinct from other types of animal and other types of life form. Um, so this narrative here becomes positioned as this idea that like once humans have kind of been genetically shifted away from some idea of like the pure human, like they lose their capacity for salvation. Like salvation is very much linked here to genetics and to biology. Um, and this plays out 
very notably in the narrative of Noah and the way that Noah gets reframed in these stories. Um, so the reason that Noah is spared the flood in the biblical narrative is that he was perfect in his generations. Like he was perfect in some way. And usually this is read as kind of moral virtuousness. He's kind of seen as like morally more, morally kind of better than his contemporaries in a similar way to the way that Lot was in the narrative of Sodom and Gomorrah, that Lot was morally different and therefore he kind of gets spared the judgment. Um, but here, this narrative becomes not moral virtuousness, but genetic purity, a narrative of a genetic purity. Um, as I kind of got quotes here, like, Noah's position is kind of uniquely uncontaminated by the mongrelized race of the Nephilim. And that, that phrasing is, is notable. Um, what's notable here, and one of the things I want to, is so the second, the two latter quotes from Hitchcock and Larson here are very much what I positioned as like first camp texts of Nephilim. They're stories that don't really focus on the Nephilim like as a key element, but like accept them as part of like a general demonology within what is more broadly kind of more traditional um, Pentecostal or charismatic like text. Um, but they're still using this narrative of kind of Noah's genetic purity or genetic kind of uncontaminatedness that is very much emphasized and kind of drawn out within um, second and third camp kind of Nephilim demonology texts. Uh, but critical, critical here is this, this conflation of genetic purity, of kind of genetic perfection with the capacity for salvation. And like, it's difficult to not read like fears of miscegenation, like fears of like cultural decline and cult contamination of kind of foreign ways, especially if we think back to the way that this is kind of generally framed within like broader um, fears of the kind of the cultural other, uh, which is critical because that is where I'm going to be talking about next. Um, just to check, what's the time? Anyway, yeah. I, it is um, 34 minutes past 11. Okay, excellent. I have time. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't have any pretty pictures on these slides, I'm afraid, because I, I ran out of time. <laughs> but so these narratives of um, this fear of kind of genetic contamination of like the the relationship of salvation to kind of being purely human in some way, like intersects a lot with reactionary fears of cultural decline and cultural kind of decadence that are very prominent in contemporary conservative evangelical milieu. Um, good example, like sometimes this is very literal. Uh, L.A. Marzulli of ancient alien fame claims that there is a modern breeding program that mirrors the watcher incursion and the goal of these new hybrids is to have them pass as human. Um, he specifically contrasts this to the idea of the Nephilim as giants, um, which is very like the traditional framing of them. So he's like, oh, you see, like there might be Nephilim that are like walking among us even now, and you would never know. Um, and this is really like I think the fact he uses pass is really interesting here, given the general framing of passing in racial terms, like within, within America broadly, this idea of racial passing. So he's very much here positioned kind of, I think drawing, probably not explicitly, but I think implicitly, like on these narratives of the contamination of a kind of purified like race of, of humans in this context by this like nebulous kind of inhuman other that like looks fully human, but you can't really tell. So there's this kind of anxiety of miscegenation, this anxiety of kind of, um, of kind of, yeah, like interracial relationships essentially, that is here being kind of supernaturalized and like framed through this language of, um, of human, of like the, the Nephilim is kind of literally inhuman. Um, yeah, um, but this interest, like as Peterson goes on, to say, and this is kind of, this is one of those more explicit shifts that kind of represent this. 
Um, Peterson's book is more historically focused. It's not focused on like contemporary Nephilim returning, but on like the Nephilim in their kind of biblical context. Um, so he writes that after the flood, the genetic threat was all but eliminated because the generally the watchers and the Nephilim have been kind of wiped out by the flood. So he says the demonic strategy shifted to spiritual corruption and like emphasis is his. Um, angels were never again going to marry human women, but he goes on, Israelite men could still be tempted by Canaanite women to worship fallen angels and demons. So he's here creating this very explicit continuity and parallel between the genetic threat of the watchers and of the Nephilim like as literally inhuman to this kind of fear of cultural contamination, of cultural kind of deviation resulting from um, foreign women, essentially in this context, like as vectors of, um, as vectors of kind of cultural decline and of kind of drawing groups away from like worship of the true God, essentially in this context. Um, it's also in case, of course, here, like that this does in some ways explicitly parallel the narrative of the Watchers in the sense that the Watchers see human women and see that they are beautiful and then kind of just are tempted to go down to earth and like abandon their, their proper station in heaven. Whereas Peterson is here like framing, essentially constructing a similar narrative where the Israelite, particularly the Israelite men, exist within their kind of pure or kind of normative culture uh, and then are kind of tempted by these seductive foreign women who um, lead them into, into devil worship. And of course, it, it's of course critical to note here that the fallen angels and demons that these people are ostensibly worshiping, um, which essentially are, are kind of pagan Canaan, Canaanite deities, are positioned like as Nephilim or as the Watchers. They are positioned explicitly as, as the kind of ghosts or the spirits of these entities. Yeah, this generally feeds into a broader narrative in contemporary texts of like anxieties over moral decay um, that are generally figured in conservative narratives by advances in reproductive and LGBT rights, uh, by the prominence of unwed parents, and by the growth of kind of non-evangelical um, Christian forms of religiosity. Uh, specifically New Age spirituality gets a lot of flack within these narratives. Um, also, they generally position demons or explicitly Nephilim, because demons within this context like are the ghosts of the Nephilim, as behind what they say is the growing lawlessness in America, as was really marked by protests for racial justice, um, generally speaking. Uh, a good example of this is uh, Eli Marzulis. Um, he wrote a book called Days of Chaos, um, which is basically just a narrative of the decline of, like, you know, the, the decline of contemporary America and the, like, rising lawlessness he sees in the nation, uh, where he explicitly positions demonic figures as behind a lot of kind of uh, protests against racial injustice or against police brutality um, in a way that he notably never really does for, like, um, and this is this is something that other like uh, James Col um, Jason Colavito, who does a blog where he talks a lot about like ancient alien discourse, um, and like he talks a bit about the Nephilim as well, has actually flagged up that Marzulli like never devotes the similar kind of attention to attacks by um, white people, like like mass murders and things in America. It's only ever like like protests by black people that. Um, Marzulli like devotes this kind of attention to. Um, this was repeated by Derek Gilbert, like not in a book, but in a kind of um, broadcast uh, in 2020 during the protests that were sparked by the murder of George Floyd, um, where he also explicitly positions like demonic forces as operating behind the protests. Like this is very much like a narrative that is being mobilized. And like, although Gilbert doesn't explicitly in that like tie the Nephilim specifically, like his general, like over a mix clear that demons in his view, like are kind of the ghosts of the Nephilim. So the ghosts of the Nephilim, like are kind of behind this kind of cultural, um, this lawlessness or the, and, and this general kind of cultural shift and unrest that exists within contemporary society. Um, this 
general integration of um, narratives of kind of moral decadence and lawlessness with technology is I think actually quite neatly encapsulated by like Horn's own trajectory in his work. I've read a lot of Horn's books, unfortunately, at this point. Um, but there's this really interesting bit where in his, his, he wrote a book in 1998 titled Spiritual Warfare, The Invisible Invasion, um, where he speculates um, very early on, he's, he's kind of confounded by this idea that at a time when he quotes the US is the most advanced civilized high tech nation in the world, um, spiritual regression and moral decay abound. And by spiritual regression and moral decay, he means like people are practicing new age spiritualities, um, people are being gay, and you know people are having children while not being married. Like these are explicitly the things he stresses. Um, but he doesn't really emphasize like the Nephilim of the Watcher narrative, like in this text. This text is very, in a lot of ways, a very traditional spiritual warfare or charismatic evangelical text that is mostly about narratives of cultural decline and the need to kind of return the nation to a kind of idea of true Christian identity. Um, over the next decade is when he really starts to kind of focus in on the Nephilim and the Watcher narrative. Um, because the later, like the idea of, of um, the idea of America as the most high tech nation in the world becomes not this kind of contrast to its like moral decay, but like this kind of co-constitutive element. Because he later claims in, a, in his 2010 book that he co-authored with his wife, Nita, um, technology is playing into the hands of a powerful supernaturalism toward a Luciferian end game. One orchestrated by gods who descended from heaven and materialized in bodies of flesh, who appear in legends of all cultures in the ancient world. So he's here, like uniting this idea of advances in technology with kind of decline of his ideas of cultural decline. And he's using the Nephilim narrative and the Watcher narrative as a way of kind of suturing these two ideas, kind of coherent them within a specific narrative. Um, yeah, so essentially what I think here is happening is that Nephilim demonologies are permitting this cohesion of distinct reactionary fears over genetic and cultural replacement, which are very prominent in contemporary kind of reactionary and right-wing movements, uh, fears of technological advance, suspicion of like corrupt rulers, this positioning of like the government, particularly the US government is kind of in thrall to Nephilim spirits, but also, and this is kind of the point I want to end on, um, of ecological collapse, and I kind of want to return to that idea of the kind of ecological dimensions of the Nephilim demonology that I want to talk about. Um, so, ideas of destructive consumption, or overconsumption, uh, and indeed climate change are almost entirely absent from neo-Nephilim demonologies or they are read as a conspiracy, conspiratorial hoax, like when they get mentioned at all. If you think back on like that, like narrative of conspiracies from Skiba's book that I talked about earlier, we talked about things like UN sustainability projects, for example, as, as part of kind of a Nephilim agenda. So there's this idea that like, either climate change is not mentioned or measures to counter it are positioned as part of kind of a Neph secret Nephilim agenda. There is one exception to narratives of overconsumption that are used in this text. And it often relates very directly to narratives of the Israelite conquest of Canaan in, in, in the biblical narrative. This is the only place where over ideas of consumption like become kind of foregrounded. And I think it's quite telling. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, the Anakim and also other Canaanite groups like the Amorites are read specifically as descended from the Nephilim, from like kind of Numbers 13, 13. Um, Canaan itself is positioned within several texts um, by Pitterson here and also by an author named Douglas Hamp as a Nephilim infested territory as kind of polluted with, with demonic hybrids. So there's this positioning of Canaan as this, this kind of space where the Nephilim exist um, that the Israelites then have to kind of go into and, and kind of conquer. 
And this is the only place where a narrative of overconsumption comes in. And like, I should warn you, like, this is going to get kind of heavy in a second. So like, forewarning. Um, yeah. So both Hamp and Skiba drew, um, use overconsumption by drawing on the Israelite spy's description of the land of Canaan as a land that devours itself. Um, they do this, ironically, in this weirdly quasi-scientistic way by calculating the caloric requirements of giants, which is very weird. Um, so Og of Bashan is a, a ruler in the Bible who basically has a really huge bed. And there are various reasons for why he has a huge bed, like historically. But like within this narrative, it's positioned that like Og has a huge bed because he's the giant. You know, it, it's like it's to size, it's to scale essentially. And they use this to then calculate like how much he eats, basically, based on based on their like assumption of his size, that they then project onto other kind of giant figures in the Bible, like Goliath like the Canaanites more broadly. So they're essentially positioning, and then they use this to explain why there are so many famines in the land. And as, as kind of Hamp explains, he ties this specifically to hierarchy. Uh, he's like, generally the strongest people get first pick of the food preferences. The spies were not exaggerating. The Nephilim were certainly eating continually and many animals must have been given to satisfy their nearly insatiable appetites. So this is the only place where overconsumption starts to play like a key part in this narrative, this idea of this land that needs to, that is going to be conquered, that is going to be overcome as kind of infested by the Nephilim who are consuming all, all the resources. And this of course ties back to that antediluvian narrative of um, consumption and of kind of destructive consumption. And this then gets really dark, um, even darker, um, in a particular way that Ryan Peterson um, flames, uh, that both of them flame it. Because to restore the land, the Israelites, quote, had to completely cleanse the land of Nephilim seed. So they basically are positioning the Nephilim as the sources of destructive consumption that essentially need to be wiped out. Um, and they draw a very specific link here between the Canaanite tribes that are coded as Nephilim descended and the ones that in, in the Israelite conquest are specifically highlighted as needing to be completely kind of destroyed, basically. Because uh, there's basically like, the Israelites get given a number of guidelines about what to do with the tribes in Canaan. And there's a few, the, not all of them, but there's a few of them who are marked for kind of complete destruction. It's like wipe, wipe them all out. And in these narratives, these specific tribes become coded as, as Nephilim, essentially, as kind of descended from the Nephilim. Um, and as Peterson writes, no person carrying the Nephilim DNA was to be left, as to do so would threaten the messianic bloodline. This ties into that narrative of, of Jesus as like, and of the Nephilim's kind of needing to wanting to corrupt Jesus. He then goes on, this genocide, as Bible detractors and skeptics often call it, was a necessary, wait, I can't see that, was a necessary military campaign to save all human beings from extinction at the hands of a corrupt superhuman race. Um, so he's essentially here being like, it's not genocide because they weren't actually human. Like, like, that's like literally his logic, which is, a, and I mean, not how, not how genocide works as a kind of way, but. Um, so this is, I think, and like, unfortunately I don't have a conclusion slide, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna be wrapping up on, on this, but like, I think this is really important because this is the one time that these narratives kind of ecological devastation kind of operate. Um, Overconsumption here is linked to the image of a kind of dehumanized or literally inhuman other. Um, the land may be devouring itself, as the quote goes, but this results not from the cosmos as is, but in the presence of a kind of deemed parasitic other that has no kind of God-given right to remain like on the land itself. So you essentially have these narratives of um, this idea that the Nephilim come from outside. They're this kind of incursion of like unnatural or like, others that kind of come into a space and corrupt it. 
um, that are here being very explicitly linked to narratives of conquest and narratives of genocide um, that are tied to this idea that if, if the land is falling apart, if like there is kind of some form of like ecological collapse, it's because of these others, it's because of these, um, these foreign entities that like don't have a legitimate claim over the space of the nation. And I think this is like, it's, they don't ever really, they don't apply this narrative directly to the contemporary day. They very much situate this within their explanations of the biblical record. But I think when you factor it in with the kind of broader political reactionary agenda and the kind of the general othering of, of kind of foreigners as a threat that exists within this narrative, I think it's very like difficult to not see this as this kind of undercurrent of almost like eco-fascistic element that kind of runs through it, where you're positioning like, like if there are problems, if there is kind of ecological collapse within the nation, here specifically America, because these people are American, this isn't due to any way that like real Americans are living. Like this isn't due to the way that like the, the proper people who belong here are acting. It's due to these like sometimes literally inhuman or like dehumanized others who, as Malzuli wrote, like Mark passes human, um, who have kind of come from outside and are like corrupting, like, and are kind of leading to this ecological collapse or leading to this ecological decline. Um, and I think it's kind of telling that like, like the Nephilim narrative is very explicitly, a, a, not very explicitly, but it has very strong connotations of like corrupted rulers or corrupted kingship, which I think like, could quite equally be applied to like in a metaphorical sense to things like corporations, for example, to ideas of consumption, to ideas of like these kind of dominant ruling entities that like control our, our world that are kind of leading to the destruction of the planet. But these people don't take the narrative in that direction. They very much like code it through these conservative narratives of the kind of dehumanized other that exists outside of the kind of proper space in the nation who are kind of coming in and are over consuming and are like leading to to kind of cultural and ecological decline. And so it's kind of a combination of these factors like this is kind of like why why I think the Nephilim narrative is returning in some ways like in these reactionary discourses to kind of return to the point that I said earlier um, because it not only allows this confluence of these narratives of threat, of, of sexual threat, of ontological threat, of ecological and technological threat, but it also constructs all of these threats as coming from a literally dehumanized or inhuman outside. It distracts any, any kind of critique of the system in which these, or the, the cosmos in which these people have it. Like if the cosmos is going irretrievably wrong, it's not because of anything to do with us, it's something to do with them. And I think that's where I'm going to, I'm going to wrap up today. Thank you all. <laughs>